after Ragnarok ended, I said to myself, well, they finally did it. They finally went full Jack Kirby. It's about time. That's not entirely accurate upon reflection. These Marvel movies have always owed more to early 2000s comics than mid to late 1960s comics. More Brian Hitch and Steve Epting than Jack Kirby and Steve Ditko. And this one is no exception. But I also noticed quite a bit of Walt Simonson in there as well, as did he on his Twitter. And nothing says Kirby to me like a space opera that sprawls across the entire known universe. Or a time when the old gods died. So after two failed attempts, we finally have a Thor movie that actually resembles Thor comics. Better late than never. Anything's better than a $150 million remake of Beastmaster 2. Even a patchwork of half-formed ideas that went through a Rolodex worth of directors. At least Ragnarok only had three writers, as opposed to Dark World's five. And as far as I know, director Taika Waititi was the only one to make it all the way through Marvel's arcane selection process. In a surprise to me, said process doesn't involve a sacrifice to Pan, the god of panic, or Gore, the god butcher. Apparently, our director got this job by making a sizzle reel of action scenes from previous Thor films, set to Immigrant Song by Led Zeppelin. A song about a Viking pining for home as he raids villages along the western shore. The suits at Marvel Disney allegedly took one look at this and said, Great! Love it! By the way, what's that song you used? Displaying the even temper and presence of mind you want from a big-budget movie director, our director said, It's Immigrant Song by Led Zeppelin. One of the most popular and successful rock songs by one of the biggest acts of all time. And he did not ask any of the follow-up questions I might have asked in his place. Like, have you all seriously never listened to a classic rock station in your whole damn lives? You live in L.A., you're stuck in traffic all the time, what the hell are you doing with yourselves? Taking calls? Never mind, of course you're taking calls. Or... Has the robot apocalypse already happened? Somebody give me a damn Voight Compt machine. We're going to be asking some hard questions about tortoises up in here. The suits were probably already calculating how much the rights for a Zeppelin song would cost. So they hooked Watiti up with our three writers, and he in turn hooked them up with Weta Workshops, the production designers behind Lord of the Rings, and the Hobbit trilogy. But we shouldn't hold that against them. Theirs was, frankly, some of the best work in that whole depressing saga, and they did enough good work here to convince people like me that Marvel had finally gone full Jack Kirby. Hell, the whole art department deserves mad props for this one, and I'm gonna give it to them. As do our three writers. One of them, Eric Pearson... Pearson? Pearson. Sorry, dude. Was the story editor for Agent Carter's TV show. May it rest in power. The other two are veterans of the various animated series that were pretty much all we comic book fans had to work with before the Disney buyout. Both Craig Kyle and Christopher Yost came up through 2003's X-Men Evolution. The X-Men cartoon I eventually learned to like a lot more than the adjectiveless X-Men cartoon everyone's nostalgic for now. Certainly like it more than any of the live-action films. First class accepted. Gratefully, I've lived long enough now to see some of their stuff make it into live-action films. But we'll talk about Logan later. Yost also worked on The Dark World, so there is some carryover of tone. Particularly in the interactions between Odin's sons. Kyle's gotten a producer credit on all these Thor movies. But he also has a screen story credit on a little 2010 animated feature called Planet Hulk based on the 2006 series of the same name, it's about the Hulk getting blasted off Earth, crash landing on a complete nothing planet called Sakaar, and having to fight his way out of gladiatorial slavery. Ragnarok also borrows heavily from Michael Omig and Daniel Berman's six-part 2004 arc, which stood as the grand finale of Thor's series for three whole years. Until he came back from the dead. Like you do. That this Ragnarok managed to synthesize so many disparate sources from so many different eras into a coherent story is amazing in itself. 
but it's also something superhero animated series have been doing for years. I'm glad someone in the Disney sweatshop finally noticed. Hey, maybe we should give these cartoon people a chance. Kyle being a producer, and thus officially recognized as a person by the system, probably helped out as well. Fact is, the serialized storytelling format of monthly comics translates much better to weekly TV shows than it does to buy or try annual movies. Also, the lack of money riding on a cartoon's success often leads to a relative lack of corporate oversight, allowing for more experimentation by the artists involved. And since the Marvel Universe's are so fucking weird, all you really have to do to experiment is adapt stuff that these movies have been too scared to touch for ten years. Like how they originally felt they couldn't make the Asgardians gods, because that would open up a whole can of metaphysical worms. So they became aliens, who somehow managed to look, think, and act exactly like we Earthers do, complete with all of our hang-ups. Like in Star Wars. Also like Star Wars, Thor's movies, up until now, have presented themselves as sprawling, epic space operas that can easily be boiled down to one fucked up family's never-ending internal drama. The members of that family just casually refer to themselves as gods now because fuck it. Oh, you thought that was just Loki's thing, because being a conceited little shit is his entire deal? Well, too bad. At this point, it should be clear that no one's going to scream about Thor leading their precious Christian children to paganism and witchcraft, like they did with Harry Potter. Or if they are, no one at Marvel's going to hear about it, because money is the best insulation in the world. Against long odds, this creative team managed to make a movie that continues Thor's arc and effectively critiques the failings of its predecessors by... doing a lot of the same things only better. As in the Dark World, Thor must confront an ancient and powerful entity bent on remaking the universe in their own image. Damn the consequences, full genocide ahead. As in the first movie, Thor is almost immediately depowered and set adrift on an alien world, where he must climb back up from the bottom of the social ladder. Only this time, that world is as alien to him as it is to us, the audience and the ancient and powerful being he confronts actually gets some screen time. Near the end of things, Hela accuses Odin of solving all of his problems by papering them over. Thor counters with, or by sending them away, as he well knows. But Odin exiled his favorite son in the hope that the experience would teach him some much-needed humility. And it worked, mostly thanks to Jane Foster, as played by Natalie. Sorry. That happens sometimes. Thor's time with the Avengers only reinforced this lesson, as he saw how much destruction his people, or anyone with a comparable amount of power, might wreck upon an unsuspecting universe of civilians who were mostly just trying to get by. Here he comes back home at last, only to find out that his home's built on a foundation of lies and bullshit. Like Captain America in Winter Soldier. Only more explicit. Can't get accused of being too political if you couch everything in a fantasy allegory. If you forgot the end of the Dark World, I don't blame you. Loki faked his own death, again, and usurped Odin as Asgard's ruler, again. Thor finds all of this out from the fire giant Surtur, Asgard's prophecy destroyer. And by the time he and Loki find Odin, with a little help from a local doctor, it's too late. The old man has just enough time to warn them about their long-exiled older sister before he expires, and his death frees Hela from... I don't know, Hela Jail? Wherever she's been this whole time? Being the firstborn, she overpowers both the boys without even really trying, and kicks them both out of the Bifrost somewhere between Asgard and Earth. They land on the planet Sakaar, which bears almost no resemblance to the Sakaar in the comics. That Sakaar was a post-apocalyptic wasteland. Mad Max meets ancient Rome, 
but with power armor and zombies, and ruled over by a 9-11 truther's vision of W. The spikes were an inside job. This Sakaar is the most Jack Kirby planet I've seen outside of a comic book. A patchwork of 1960s futurism, hard-edged angularity, and good old-fashioned piles of junk. The lived-in, constantly used, high-tech but run-down space fantasy futurism everybody praises Star Wars for. Either oblivious to, or uncaring about, where Star Wars got it in the first fucking place emphasized by the fact the planet's orientation video calls Sakaar the collection point for all lost and unloved things. The galaxy's own island of misfit toys, ruled over by the first lost and the first found, whatever that means, the Grand Master. He's very different from any Grand Master I've ever met, but he's Jeff Goldblum, so I don't care. He's having more fun than I've seen him have in ages, and that's infectious all by itself. Between him and Benicio del Toro's collector, we've now seen two ancients in the cinematic universe, and they've both been their own kind of pack rat, living on the fringes of galactic society. Is their constant hoarding of objects, including people they treat like objects, the last symptom of a longing for the civilizations they outlived so long ago no one even remembers the names of their species? I don't know, but it's fun to imagine. Loki's already there and sliming his way to the top, mostly by schmoozing at parties, being his usual unhelpful self. Luckily for Thor, Hulk is also there, and he's taken to gladiatorial pit fighting like a shark to water. How did he get there? Was that Quinjet Nick found at the end of Avengers 2 just a relic of some other S.H.I.E.L.D. mission that ended as well as they usually end? We'll probably never know. Anyone want to pop over to the universe where Universal Pictures isn't holding future Hulk movies hostage? Maybe there's a universe where they're still owned by a vodka company, and they aren't making any more Jurassic Parks. Meanwhile, in Universe 2 times 10 to the 5th, the Hulk has been Hulk for two years, meaning he's learned to speak, meaning he can finally, finally, have a conversation with his co-stars. Limited and monosyllabic, though those conversations may be. I mean, we're not at Peter David yet. We're not even really close, but hey, every little bit helps. As in Planet Hulk, he's found a greater degree of equanimity on Sakaar than he ever could on Earth. Better to be the reigning champion of the local blood sport circus than the pariah on a team of pariahs. So after Hulk actively interferes with his escape attempts, Thor must forge a connection with puny Banner, of all people, who has no idea what the fuck's going on once he shrinks down. And the one other Asgardian on world. The last of the Valkyries. The rest of the Valkyries died fighting Hela way back when, and Tessa Thompson's character has been drinking her way across the galaxy ever since. Can this motley crew stir up a local insurrection, steal a starship, and get back to Asgard before Hela takes the whole place over? Well, duh. That's just the skeleton of the story, and it's the meat that interests me. They couldn't make Hela Loki's daughter, as she is in Norse mythology without having some major splainin' to do. But making her Odin's daughter allows a Marvel movie to finally critique the hypocrisies of imperialism. Or, at the very least, finally bring them up. They've been simmering down in the subtext of pretty much all these films ever since Iron Man. It's like someone went, hey, did you like the Vulture's whole rich and the powerful they do whatever they want speech from Homecoming? Well, how about a feature-length version of that? Yes, please. Right, right here. They made this for me, is what I'm saying. The Grand Master is a living embodiment of that speech, and Sakaar is a breathing example of exactly what happens when they do whatever they want. But he's only the latest Avatar. Asgard being another. It's always looked nice but the status quo it represents only looks more rotten by the day. 
the first Thor movie showed us that the peace Odin imposed from on high was actually so fragile, his sons almost broke it by accident. Dark World showed us one of the presumably many peoples Odin crushed in order to bring that peace about, coming back for some revengeance. Since then, two Guardians of the Galaxy movies in a row have shown us a Milky Way practically filled to bursting, with warlords, egoists, pirate gangs, and straight-up death mongers. Where the one-party state of Xandar looks like the only safe bet for anyone who wants to settle down and raise a brood. And now hell comes to Asgard Town. A walking, talking refutation of all her father's good intentions. Symbolized quite well by the ceiling mosaic she blasts open as soon as she gets to the throne room. Revealing the older, uglier, but far more truthful mosaic that was underneath it all this time. Odin always presented himself as the benignly neglectful patriarch of a society of well-meaning party animals. And now we see this for the late-in-life exercise in image management it really was. A god-king's own midlife crisis. An attempt to paper over, well, tile over, but whatever. A tyrannical past where slaves built him golden palaces. Where do you think all this gold came from? Hela asks. And of course, Thor has no answer. He was raised specifically never to consider that question. Probably in the hope that he'd grow up to be the king Odin pretended he'd always been. But all that did was create the cruel, arrogant boy we met at the beginning of Thor 1. The boy who had to have everything taken from him before he learned to value anything. Ragnarok opens with him still valuing the wrong things, having spent the two incontinuity years since Age of Ultron literally chasing a dream, a prophetic dream about Asgard's destruction. Which, by the end of things, Thor will help fulfill in order to stop his evil sister from spreading destruction across the cosmos with her army of skeleton warriors and her giant wolf. Because Asgard, as Odin's ghost says during the make-or-break part of the third act, is not a place, it's a people. A good sentiment, and true, since to be a hero, in the strictest sense, is to guard your people from death. This is why our hero has been unable to unlock his full slate of thunder and lightning powers until right here, at the end of all things. Because of course it doesn't have to be the end of all things as long as some of your people survive. Might have been nice to get to know some of those people before death came for them. The few we've spent any good amount of time with are hardly what I'd call a representative sample. The Warriors Three, much to my displeasure, get got within seconds of us seeing them again, just to prove Hela's super serial. And no one seems to know where the fuck Sif's gone. It's left to poor Idris Elba to shoulder all the weight, as usual. And he spends the whole movie shepherding Asgardian civilians through the rolling green hills we've also barely seen in three movies. Once again, he's the fixed point, the last man standing. Thor never had a guy in the chair, to use Homecoming's phrase. But he did have a guy at the Bifrost, who could apparently see everything. Wish a bit more had been made of the Odin son's connection to his older, wiser friend. A good paternalistic friendship can do a lot for you. Especially if your bio dad is an aloof monarch concealing deep, dark secrets in his past. Ooh. Both the best and worst things you can say about these Marvel movies is, meh, they're fun. Bringing up images of rollicking good times and pointless frivolity that goes in one ear and out the other. Through your eyeballs and straight out the back of your head. It's the contrast that gets people. And the apparent need to reinforce that contrast in every single scene. There is no dramatic moment that cannot be undermined with a joke. It's what the ancient critics called bathos. Bathos? No. Bathos. I'm going to go with bathos, because if I say bathos, that makes me think of someone else, which... Ugh. No. Just no. 
as opposed to pathos, which you might have heard about, things that are supposed to inspire pity or sadness in an audience, bathos is all about undercutting that shit, usually for satirical or comedic effect. It's like when somebody farts at a funeral. Korg is a perfect example. A serious character, treated seriously in the comics, and turned here into the comic relief of a film where I occasionally needed relief from the comedy. Aww, did your dad die thanks to the machinations of your evil brother? And did your dad spend your whole life hiding the truth about himself and your evil sister? Well, here, have a dick joke. Aw, are you trapped on a planet where the only person you know besides your evil brother is a barely articulate rage monster? Well, here's another dick joke. For contrast. And of course, there's the implied dick joke that just is the Hulk, but we'll talk about that more in the Infinity Wars to come. Right now, let's talk about frivolity. From a general audience's perspective, frivolity can be a good thing. A welcome relief from a world where everything shouts at you about how it's the most important thing ever. Jerk off motion. And from a bloodless corporate vampire perspective, frivolity can be your best friend. It is, after all, in your best interest to treat each of these movies like a disposable product. Especially when you're trying to put out three a year, and each of them has to make a billion dollars in order to justify their existence. According to our director, he even asked his new bosses if the amount of humor was really appropriate for the subject matter. What with all the death, and destruction, and the slavery and such. And they apparently told him, no, man, we love it! In fact, put in more! Jokes for the joke god! Ugh. Honestly, I don't mind when the jokes flow from the characters and their reaction to the ambient absurdity of their situation. But I can also see the seeds of disaster germinating in this mentality. I grew up learning that history repeated itself as farce and then tragedy, but nobody told me the farce and the tragedy could happen at the same time. And frankly, it's fucking with me, you guys. Because this is all really absurd when you stand back and think about it. We finally have a Thor movie I can unreservedly call good, and all it took was two mediocre ones and two fair-to-mediocre Avengers movies. Deprived of all the trappings of godly kingship, most of which he never wanted in the first place, the son of Odin finally feels like he's earned his place as god-king. Now all he has to do is find a new home for his people. Guess it's back to Earth for us all. Thanks for watching, everyone. Special thanks to Mr. Hootie Dean, Detective Steve, and the After Movie Diner. If you'd like to be one of our glorious patrons, then shoot us a dollar over on the Patreon. And if you liked this video, hit the like button and the subscribe button and all the little buttons that pop up when you hit share. Next time, Jurassic World.